If you're currently planning your dream trip to Europe, odds are one of the most stressful obstacles is figuring out where to stay. After all, proper planning can mean the difference between staying here, here, and here. Don't worry though, in this video, I'm walking you through the step-by-step -step process to finding amazing accommodation in Europe. Stick around until the end and I'll also be giving you some bonus tips on how to find free accommodation in Europe and also be giving you a checklist for finding the perfect accommodation every single time. Now, let's get to it. First things first, when it comes to accommodation, you have to realize that best is really subjective because it depends on what your priority is. When I talk about accommodation, oftentimes I'll look at it in terms of this triangle. Price, location, and quality, you can only pick two. If it's a good location and good quality, it'll probably be very expensive. If it's a good price and location, the room is most likely not gonna be the best. And if it's a good price and good quality, you're probably not gonna be in the center center. So before you start searching, be sure to look into what your main priority is, because that's gonna give you a lot of clarity moving forward when you're doing your whole booking process. Now let's get to the fun stuff. Here is my process for finding and booking accommodation. So first thing I'll do is I'll hop on booking.com. This isn't an ad okay, but I genuinely do use booking.com all the time when I I'm searching up hotels, at least as a discovery tool, just because I think that their tools and filters that they offer are the best. You can, of course, also use the hotels function on Google or other third-party sites like hotels.com, but this is just the one that I prefer and the one that I'm gonna be showing you. Now, spoiler, I do recommend at the end to book your properties directly, but for now, during the research phase, definitely do use these aggregators just because they give you so many more options and it's really helpful to be able to see at a glance all the different places that you can stay at. So the first thing I'll do is type in my destination, my my dates and specify how many people and how many rooms. And then I click search and you'll get something crazy like thousands of results. Now, before I show you how to effectively vet and filter all these different options, I'm gonna give you a quick overview for those of you who have never used this website before. So in the center here, there are of course all the different options. The default is their top picks, whatever that means, but you can also click here and sort by all these different options as well. In the upper right hand corner, super handy is the map view, which is one of my favorite tools. You can use that to look at hotels based on their location. And then when you scroll to the left, there's all these filters that you can toggle on and off to further refine your results. Isn't that so fun? Anyways, what I usually do is I turn on these filters. Right off the bat, I only choose hotels that are an eight plus rating because from experience, that's kind of the bare minimum to ensure that there's no huge problems with the property like mold, bed bugs, or awful staff, things like that. And then I'll toggle on free cancellation because for me, non-refundable bookings don't really make sense, especially if you're booking a trip really far in advance because at the end of the day, anything could happen, especially these days. So it's really good to have the option to cancel, especially when there are so many hotels that do offer free cancellation anyway. And then just like that, we've narrowed it down by two thirds. So that's a great start. Now, I don't usually do star rating filters just because I've noticed that the star rating on booking.com can be a little bit weird. Like sometimes you'll find apartments that are rated five stars for some reason. And as I mentioned in my video last Last week, the star system in Europe works really differently to North America, whereas in North America, the number of stars a property gets more or less corresponds with the quality of the property itself. In Europe, it's a little bit different. It more corresponds to a checklist of amenities. So one or two star properties usually won't have the big amenities like a gym, a concierge, etc. It doesn't necessarily mean they're bad. It just means they don't have the big box amenities that a larger hotel might have. So overall, I don't really like using star filters for that reason. Some other filters worth turning on would be accommodation type. So so, you know, if you want a hotel and definitely not a hostel or an apartment, you can check that. And just a little side note, I'm way too old for hostels these days, but if you are backpacking around Europe and you're looking for hostels specifically, a website I really recommend for that is Hostel World. They're really great and you can just actually make bookings by paying a really tiny deposit rather than paying for the entire thing up front, which I think is really great. All right, and because I'm personally happy to do either a hotel or a guest house, now it's time to sort the options in a more meaningful way. I like to sort by lowest price because usually these will be the least nice options. And I really like working my way from like the crappiest places to the nicer places because honestly, if you do it the other way around, after you've seen a place like this, you're not gonna wanna stay in a place like this. So it's best to go from worst to the best. So at this point, I'll just go through the list and I'll open up a tab for each of the options that I just like the look of. I'm such a tab addict, it's ridiculous, but yes, don't overthink it. Have a quick look and if you like it, right click, open a new tab and done. And if there's any familiar chains that you like or have status with, uh, be sure to open those into a new tabs as well. All right, so I'll continue to do this, scrolling through opening new tabs until I reach a price point that makes me wanna gouge my eyes out. That's usually my sign to stop. 
And if you're open to vacation rentals, then what I might also do is hop on either Airbnb or Verbo just to double check if there are any additional options. As I mentioned in last week's video, Airbnb these days isn't as worth it as before. There's a ton of fees and there's a lot of additional labor when it comes to you know meeting up with the host, kind of doing chores afterwards. But if you are a bigger group or you want a homier space, then it might still be an option to consider. So if I'm looking into a vacation rental, I'll hop onto Airbnb and enter my destination and dates. I'll also tend to toggle on the following filters. So entire place, Wi-Fi, and any other amenities that I personally find non-negotiable. I'll then go on the map view and shortlist a few that I like the look of. So after I shortlist any potential Airbnbs, I'll then go to another site for my shortlist and that's Premier Inn. I don't always look for Premier Inn. It's usually only when there's a big event on or the prices for everything else seem really crazy and I just want a budget friendly place to stay. Now this is a chain that's based in the UK, so they have lots Lots of locations there, but they're kind of expanding and they do have other properties elsewhere in Europe. Lots of locations that are pretty bare bones, but really reliable and always cheap. They are famous though for having 800 plus properties, none of which are available on third party booking sites. So if you want to look for their properties, you have to go directly. Lastly, if it's a special occasion and I'm wanting to stay somewhere really nice and aesthetic with a view or something unique to it, I'll just hop on social media, usually TikTok and I'll type in my destination and hotel. This can often show you some really unique properties, probably expensive ones, but if that price is no obstacle, then this is definitely another great way to add more hotels to your shortlist. With the shortlist done, I'll review them again just to see if there are any now that seem like an instant no compared to the other options. Usually there's quite a few. And after I whittle the list down to my finalists, I'll cross-reference with Google reviews. I find that the rating that hotels have on third-party websites don't necessarily give you a full picture idea of what the hotel is gonna be like. So I definitely recommend at least cross-referencing with some reviews before you make a booking. So what I'll usually do is I'll type the hotel name, then I'll just look on Google reviews. Again, it's not enough to just look at the average score. You should really read into individual reviews just because the score that you see is kind of an accumulation of reviews from the past few years. So it doesn't necessarily tell you how the hotel is now, especially if maybe they've changed ownership or if they've changed things up through renovations, things like that. You should really look at some of the newer reviews just so that you have an idea of what to expect. So I'll read through the newest reviews, have a quick skim, and if everything looks all right, then I'll keep it on my shortlist. But oftentimes, especially if you're booking for a place that seems a little bit too good to be true, what you'll see is there's some red flags, like, oh, uh, this place is doing renovations right now, it's super noisy, or hey, there's a heat wave going on right now and they don't have air conditioning, things like that. Another thing I'll do, especially for properties that don't have a super high average rating, is I'll also look specifically at their one-star reviews, just to get a gauge on whether those one-star reviews are fair or not. Oftentimes you'll see, okay, like a bunch of one-star reviews that say the same thing. In that case, you can probably concede, okay, that is a real flaw of the hotel. But sometimes there's just these crazy one-star reviews left by clearly disgruntled customers. And you can almost tell based on the way they've written the review that they were kind of in the wrong. So I like to give hotels a fair chance, especially if there's like a huge discrepancy. Like if there's a bunch of five-star reviews and then just like a handful of one-star reviews that's dragging the rating down, I really like to investigate further and look into that. All right, after you've read all the reviews and you have your final shortlist, it's time to make a decision. Honestly, at this point, if you've done all this work, your shortlist is probably full of really good options, so you really can't go wrong with them. But, you know, take some time to decide, weigh the pros and cons, and then make your decision. Now, after you've chosen the hotel, the last check that you should make before you book is to see if it's cheaper to book directly with the hotel. Oftentimes, hotels will offer you some kind of incentive, as I mentioned before, to book directly with them, whether it's a discount, free Wi-Fi, free breakfast, anything like that. So look directly on the hotel website, see if there's a deal, and then book. All right, so you've chosen the hotel, you've decided where you're gonna book it. Now, the last thing you should do is to look into options that'll help you maximize cashback or points. Because at the end of the day, even if you're on a budget, you're gonna end up spending quite a bit of money on hotels. So you should look into ways that you can actually maximize the rewards that you get from spending money on this trip. So first off, you could get a travel rewards credit card, which is always a really good start. But even if you don't wanna use a travel credit card, there's a lot of other websites that you can use to potentially accrue points. So the British Airways executive club store, for example, if you fly frequently with British Airways, you might be collecting Avios points. So you can hop on their store and then you can actually get three points for every dollar that you spend on Airbnb or even eight Avios points for every pound that you spend on booking.com. So you can actually rack up a bunch of points just by booking through their portal because they have a special partnership. You can also look into cashback sites like Rakuten, which offer you cashback when you book through them. Now, this isn't going to be a huge amount of money, usually one to 3%, but if you're using it frequently, it can add up to a nice little 
random check one day, so why not? And lastly, if you are booking with a chain hotel, do look into whether or not they have a loyalty program that you can join for free. Oftentimes they'll give you some kind of perk like free Wi-Fi or free breakfast in exchange for joining. And then you can also accrue points for future stays. Oh, sorry, I know I said lastly, but the last thing, last, last thing I will say on that topic is if you are looking into booking with a third party, another hotel website worth considering is hotels.com. Um, and one really cool program that they have is if you book 10 nights, then you get one night for free. But yeah, if you don't travel frequently enough to do like hotel points status at a certain chain, you can just book with hotels.com, book a bunch of different properties, and then eventually work your way up to a free night at some point in the future. All right, so we've covered standard bookable accommodation. But if you are on a budget and you are open to maybe a different style of accommodation, there are quite a few options that allow you to actually stay in Europe for free. And so I'm gonna quickly outline those options now. So first off, there's Couchsurfing, which is a free community that you can join. It's essentially a network of travelers from all around the world who are open to meeting new people. So they'll often, you know, say, oh, okay, you can crash at my place, sleep on my couch. And in exchange, then maybe one day you'll host them. It's very much like a goodwill based kind of community. It's definitely not for everyone, certainly not for introverts, but it's an option to look into if you're really on a budget. There's also house swaps. So let's say you live in a place and you want to live longer term in another destination. You never know, you might be able to find someone from that destination who wants to swap places with you like in the holiday. So that's another option to look into. There's also house sitting and pet sitting. So there's certain websites like these ones that you can browse where people will say they're looking for someone to look after their place or someone to look after their pets while they're gone. Um, and so oftentimes you can get free accommodation in exchange for watching over the house or watching someone's pets. And last but not least, there's certain websites where you can find people who will host you for free in exchange for you performing some kind of labor for them. So there's like websites like this one and this one where you can say, okay, like stay on a farm and help paint fences in exchange for accommodation. All right, thank you so much for watching. If you're looking for that checklist to help you book the perfect accommodation every time, you can find that here. And if you're looking for more practical travel tips in the future, be sure to like and subscribe. Thanks for watching. See you next week. Bye.